1900, athletes were popular subjects for the motion picture camera. Eugene Sandow was the world's most famous strongman and traveled the vaudeville circuit, popularizing bodybuilding and physical culture. Miss Marshall won the women's title at the Madison Square Physical Culture Show in 1904. Judges liked her lovely form, and she reenacted her routine for the Edison camera. Al Trelore won the men's title. Men were judged on muscular development and strength. Agility was more important than muscle to a gymnast like Lukens. His high bar act was a combination of skill and showmanship. You were never too young for athletics. This baby acrobat was known as La Petite Alma. Contortionists were always popular subjects for the early motion picture camera. Nearly all the vaudeville shows, amusement parks, and circuses had contortionists. During this period, exotic exercises became extremely popular. President Roosevelt even studied jujitsu. Bag punching was an exercise that lots of people did at the gym. Gus Keller was an expert and made his living from punching bags in vaudeville shows. Professional boxers had to keep in shape. In 1901, Gus Ruland, the Akron giant, was training for the heavyweight bout against mighty Jim Jeffries. In 1905, these wrestlers at the New York Athletic Club were Olympic champions. They had won gold medals in wrestling the year before at the Olympics in St. Louis. May 8, 1905, opening day at the Belmont Park Racecourse. Horse racing had always been the sport of kings. Now, new racetracks were making it a sport for the masses. By 1904, a new kind of racing was getting the public attention. Cars on Long Island were racing the back roads. The prize was the Vanderbilt Cup. Sponsor William K. Vanderbilt Jr. believed racing was the best way to test cars. How fast could they go? Besides, it was great sport. 25,000 spectators agreed. George Heath won the first Vanderbilt Cup with an average speed of 52 miles per hour. The public was fascinated with automobiles and joined motor clubs. Charles Glidden organized motor tours all over the country, like this one in 1905 up Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Glidden believed that the automobile's most important qualities were reliability, endurance, and touring comfort. Nineteen oh one was the fiftieth anniversary of the America's Cup, and Columbia led the United States to victory over England's Shamrock II, owned by Sir Thomas Lipton, the tea magnate. Atlantic City and Coney Island were the watering spots of the working class, and the beaches were always crowded on Sundays. Between May and September, 200,000 people a day came to Coney Island to swim in the ocean, and there were boardwalks and amusement parks nearby. Coney Island was the new port of the masses, a carnival city filled with people of all ages out to have a good time. At Luna Park, Steeplechase Park, and Dreamland, the business was amusing the millions, all for 10 cents a ride.
Luna Park had elephants, the largest herd of show elephants in the world, even more than P.T. Barnum. Coney Island offered something for everyone. There were hot dogs and popcorn, seafood and beer, sideshows with giants and midgets, fat ladies and freaks, merry-go-rounds, roller coasters, even boxing horses. Dreamland's most unusual show was called Fighting the Flames, a disaster extravaganza. Several times a day, spectators cheered heroic firemen as they battled the flames of a burning building, and residents jumped into safety nets below. Americans in 1900 seemed to have a fascination with disaster. Island promoters borrowed ideas from every source. The chariot race in the Hippodrome was inspired by Lou Wallace's best-selling novel, Ben-Hur. At night, it was magic. Night was turned into day. The natural order of things turned around, just like the rides. There were a quarter million electric lights at Luna Park. Dreamland had a million. Midways and amusement parks were spreading all across the country, but there was only one Coney Island. It was the biggest and the best.